Let's go to God in prayer. God, thank you just for this chance to worship you and to focus on, on who you are in our lives. And we just thank for everyone that's, that's here this morning in person and online, for those who are going to engage later uh, on our website. And we just thank you and praise you for the technology that just brings all of us together in worship. And so, God, help us to focus on who you are for just the next uh, few minutes and just drop all of the distractions that maybe we came in here with. And then, God, we thank you for our students, our middle and high school students, and just um, for the way they've, they've carried themselves over the last very, very difficult year. Uh, thank you for this opportunity that they have to, to kind of get away and forget about a lot of that stuff and to, to focus on, on their group and on each other and relationships and especially on you. Uh, thank you for Lex and Jessica and their leadership with our students and all of our adults who, who invest in them uh, throughout the year. Uh, and just bless their time. Keep them safe. Now, God, open our hearts and our minds to the things you want us to know today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. So welcome. It's great to, to see everybody. If you're online, thanks for joining us uh, this morning. If you're catching us a little bit later, thanks for engaging that way. And welcome to all of you who, who are here um, if you're not traveling, it's great to have you. Those, I mean, you know, lots of people are traveling on vacation. If that's probably going to be you in another week or two, I'm not sure. Um, but it is great to be worshiping together. Uh, just a couple announcements. We are doing a diaper drive for Cindy and Camillo. They are expecting uh, their first little one in August. And just one of the things we like to do as a church whenever people are expecting a new baby is just to honor them by just helping to give them one of the most expensive things there are when you have a baby and one of the things that you go through the most, and that's diapers. So if you'd like to help us out, we'll be doing this for another couple of weeks. You can just pick up a pack of diapers next time you're, you're at the store and just drop them in the lobby there, and we will get them to, to, to Cindy and Camillo in just a couple of weeks. Um, also, you can have them shipped directly to us. If you, if you work using Amazon or something like that, just make sure you put the church's name on it because we also have a lot of that stuff being shipped uh, straight to us for our food drive and all of that is tagged with food justice uh, so we can distinguish between those two things if you're going to do that. And then Lex asked me while he was away to announce this that uh, our college-age students are going to be having a, um, a fireside devotional in just a couple of weeks, so make sure if you've got college-age students or if you know some college-age students who would love to engage in this, uh, we'd love to have them participate. Uh, this is for students getting ready to go to college if they haven't left yet, those who have, are back in town uh, from college. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. It'll be here on campus, uh, s'mores, volleyball, devotional, around campfire, and all that good stuff. So with all that said, we are starting a brand new series this morning, and uh, we're going to be in the Old Testament for a couple of weeks. We're going to be looking at a very, very familiar guy by the name of Moses. Um, uh, Moses was somebody who, who knew who God was, but if you read his story, he didn't really, uh, he didn't really find God until he journeyed with him. And, and, and when he found God, or, or you could even say when God found him, uh, and when God got his attention, some really, really incredible things began to happen in his life and in the, the lives of people around him. And the incredible things, I mean, they didn't just happen to him. They happened to, to an entire nation, as we're, as we're going to see in this series. So for the next couple of weeks, uh, we're going to be talking about what happens when God gets our attention as we look kind of through the lens of what happened when God got Moses' attention. So today is part one. And just as we get started, we're going to take a little break next week because I'm not going to be here. Uh, Marsha and I purchased a new house about three weeks ago, and next weekend is the dreaded moving weekend, right? If you've ever done that, you know what that's like. Um, our house has been in chaos for the last three weeks. Things, everything's bo boxed up and all that. Plus, we're leaving town for a couple of days this week to get away and then coming back and movers are showing up. So kind of chaotic, going to be chaotic, but um, uh, Dee Witten is going to be here next week. Dee is the executive director of North Star Church Network. He's been here before. You will enjoy meeting Dee if you've never met him. He's a, he's a super nice, outgoing guy. So be here next week and, and make Dee feel welcome if you are in town. Uh, so anyway, back to our series. Moses, um, Moses is someone that, that most of us are pretty familiar with probably, especially if you grew up in church, if you grew up as a kid going to Sunday school and Bible school and all that stuff, you, you kind of probably know the, the story of Moses. And like I said, Moses was a guy who was, who was used in a, an incredible, incredible way by God. And he actually uh, had this, this really neat exchange with God one day. We're going to look at that this, uh, this, uh, this morning, but, but God shows up and basically says to Moses, 
I've got something for you to do, Moses. And it was this huge thing. He actually wanted to send him to Egypt and, and help the Israelites leave Egypt. They'd been in captivity for over 400 years. And so he had this huge thing. And, and Moses had an immediate reaction when, when God got his attention and told him all of this stuff that he wanted him to do. And his reaction, I think, was very similar and maybe even the same that most of us have. He was confused. He, he didn't really know what to say. And he had a few questions for God. And he, he, here's a quick recap just on Moses' life so we'll kind of all understand where he's coming from as, as God and Moses have this kind of exchange. But, but Moses lived his, his first 40 years, the first 40 years of his life, he lived his life in Pharaoh's palace, okay, he, in, in Egypt. Moses, Moses was an Israelite, but he had been adopted into Pharaoh's family. And Pharaoh was essentially the king. He was the ruler of, of Egypt. And, and, it, and, and it's an incredible story of how Moses got there. You should go back and read. I don't have time to go all into all that detail. But Moses is essentially, he's, he's at the center of the, of the power system of Egypt, right? He's at the top, really, of, of the power center of Egypt, but Moses knew who he was. He, he knew that he wasn't an Egyptian. He knew that he'd been adopted. He knew that he was an Israelite uh, because through a, just a crazy turn of events, Moses' own biological mother actually raised him. And so she would, have, she would have educated him about who he was. It's an interesting, interesting story in the book of Exodus. Uh, so, but one day, out of frustration, Moses has grown and, and out of frustration over the fact that he's recognizing that the people of Israel are his people and that they were being held as slaves in Egypt and they're mis being mistreated and there's really not a lot he can do about it. He eventually just kind of loses his temper one day and murders an Egyptian who's, who's beating one of the Israelite slaves. And so in fear of what's going to happen to him next, he basically just runs away. He goes out and he begins to live out in the, in the desert. And, and in the desert, he spends... The next 40 years of his life, in fact, you can break Moses' years, his life up into 40-year increments. It's incredible. Uh, but he spends the next 40 years of his life out in this desert. He was a shepherd. He worked for a guy by the name of Jethro, right? Not of the Beverly Hillbillies, okay? That's Jeff Rowe, I think. But anyway, eventually he marries the boss's daughter, right? He's, he's going to inherit the family business one day, or at least part of it. And so he's got a pretty good life. I mean, kind of a perfect life. And kind of his future is just kind of all laid out for him and all planned out for him. And then he runs into a problem. He, he's out in the desert one day, like he normally would be, and he runs into this bush. And, and we call it the burning bush, right? And, and here's Here's what the writer of Exodus tells us happens. He says, One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, and suddenly the angel of the Lord appeared to him as a blazing fire in a bush. So there's this burning bush right here. And Moses was amazed because the bush was engulfed in flames, but it didn't burn up. So this bush is here. It's on fire, but it's not being consumed, right? It's not turning into ashes. Now, that moment changed everything. For Moses. Uh, God got his attention in that moment, and it ultimately changed everything in his, in his life. It was a turning point. Now, you and I are probably not going to trip over any burning bushes anytime soon along our, our way, right? But let me explain just to you what, what a burning bush experience is, or what a burning bush experience would be for us today. A burning bush is when, is when in the midst of the routine, right? In the midst of the routine, I mean, this was, this was totally unexpected, but this was just a, a typical day for Moses, a routine day, and this was just a common, ordinary bush. There were hundreds and hundreds of bushes like this out in the desert. So in the midst of the routine, when you least expect it, right? This was totally unexpected for Moses. I mean, Moses, Moses had been living there for 40 years, Years he'd woken up to that same landscape for thousands of mornings. Uh, so uh, totally unexpected for him. In the midst of a routine, when you least expect it, you're surprised by God's invitation. That's a burning bush experience for you and me today. We, we, what made this bush extraordinary was the fire. It was, it was God's presence inside of it, at the center of it. God's, God's presence changed everything. It caused this bush to catch fire. It ultimately caused Moses' life to catch fire. And when God gets our attention in similar ways, it has the power to cause our lives 
to catch fire. And, and, and then it continues. When the Lord saw that he had caught Moses' attention, he, and, and that's what God wants to do, by the way. He wants to just catch our attention. Uh, maybe he brought us here today just long enough to catch our attention about something that he wants to say to us. But when the Lord saw that he caught Moses' attention, God called to him from the bush. And he says, Moses, Moses. And here's what Moses says. He says, here am I, Moses replied. And then God says, don't come any closer. In fact, take off your sandals. For Moses, you are standing on holy ground. Now, I think one of the most amazing things about this experience that, that Moses had with God was, was the first thing he heard was his name. I mean, it got, it got real personal real quickly, didn't it? And, and Moses, Moses hears this great thing that, that God wants him to do, that God wants him to, to go back to Egypt and rescue the people and help bring them out of slavery. And he hears all of that, and he's got some questions for God. And, and I think that the questions that, that Moses asks are the same questions that you and I ask a lot of time when God gets our attention. When, when we sense or when we hear or when someone comes along and challenges us that, that, that maybe this is what God wants to do in our lives or through our lives. So this morning, we're going to just take a look at these, at these questions and, and how God answered each one of these questions for Moses because he answers them the same way for us. And so there's four questions we face uh, when God gets our attention. And the first one is this, who am I? Right? Who, who am I? Or, or Moses probably would have said more like, you know, who am I to do this? Or, or even, even saying it like this, how am I to do this? How am I going to do this? I mean, this was, this was Moses' question. Here's what the writer writes. He says, Moses says, who am I? Who am I, God, to appear before Pharaoh? How, how can you expect me? How can you expect me to do this? How can you expect me to, to lead them out, to lead them out? Of Egypt. Uh, Moses was saying, God, how am I going to do this? I'm just, I'm too ordinary and, and, and I'm not qualified to do this. And, and the truth is, if God asks you to do something great and, and all you're looking at at yourself and your own abilities and all of that, you aren't qualified either and neither am I. Now, you're always going to be too old or too young. You're, you're, or you're not going to have enough experience or enough resources. Or, or you're not going to have the right education. Or you're going to have too much education. Uh, Moses is, is hearing this invitation from God, and, and he feels like he, he has nothing to offer. And, I mean, do you ever feel that way? I mean, I mean, Moses faced that feeling that I have nothing to offer you, God. And, and God had an answer for him. When he, when he said, you know, who am I to do this? God answered him and said, God told him and said, I will be with you. I will be with you. I mean, the amazing thing about, about that is, is God could have built Moses up. He could have, God could have said to Moses, God could have said, Moses, who are you? I mean, what do you, what do you mean, who are you, Moses? You, you're the guy who grew up in Pharaoh's household, right? You're the guy, you understand that system, that political system, that government, the ins and outs of that on a personal level better than anybody else that I could have picked in Israel. Who are you, Moses? You, you, you might just be the best person for the job. I mean, God could have said all of that, but instead of saying that, uh, because he knows that that just wouldn't have been enough for Moses, he says to Moses, he says, I will be with you. I will be with you. And that was enough. And he didn't, he didn't point to Moses' qualifications. He pointed to God's presence and God's greatness. He pointed to what, to what he, God, could do. Uh, my guess is, is, is some of you, some of us, maybe we need to hear God saying that right now. Uh, maybe, maybe you're going through a transition in your life right now, and it's one, of the, it's one of the most challenging transitions you've ever been through. Or maybe you're getting ready to go through that, and, and everything is changing, or it's all kind of just up in the air, and, and maybe God brought you here this morning so that you can hear him say, whatever you're going through, I will be with you. I will be with you. Uh, some of you, maybe, maybe you're going through some sort of problem in your life, and, it, and it's tough. And you're just wondering, how am I ever going to make it through this? And God brought you here so that he could say, I will be with you. And, and I'm sure uh, some of you are feeling like, like God's maybe tapping you on the, on the shoulder. And he's saying, I want to do something in your life. Or I want to do something through your life. And I want you to do something on my behalf. And, and you're just not sure you can do it. And, and God wants to, to say to you, I will be with you. Who am I? God will be with you. That, that's where Moses starts. 
And, and after God says, says, I will be with you, there's a, there's a second question that, that Moses has, and it's pretty obvious, right? And it's this. It's, okay, God, you're going to be with me. Who are you? Who are you, God? And, and, and God gives him a real simple answer, two words. He says, I am, right? I am. That's, that's God's answer. And here's what he said to Moses. He says, they will ask, talking about the Egyptians and talking especially about the Israelites, they will ask me, which God are you talking about? What's his name? What should I tell them? And God replied, I am the one who always is. Just tell them, I am. There's our word. I am has sent you. Now, Moses was probably thinking when he hears that, you know, God, that's not really all that helpful. I mean, I mean, God, could you at least finish the sentence? I mean, I am, right? Uh, but do you know what? That, that I am, that's one of the most important and most powerful names of God. And here's, here's what it means. Uh, what God was saying to Moses and, and, and what he's giving him to give to the people of Israel it, that he's going to talk to is, is he's saying, tell them this, Moses. Tell them that, that I am the one who can meet their needs. That every time a need arises, I am the one who can meet it. That's what God was saying. Now, how do I know that? Because when, when you look at the rest of the Old Testament, uh, God uses this name, this I am name, again and again and again and again. And, and he uses it, and as he uses his name, he just kind of keeps tacking on a different ending for it. And, and as a need comes up uh, in the lives of God's people, he just puts on a new name, a new ending to this name. At one point, the, the people of Israel were, were wandering around the desert. That was the last 40 years of Moses' life. And they had a need for food. They'd run out of food. And so they cried out to God, God, we, we have a need for provision here. And, and God came along and he said, I am your provision. He said, I am Jehovah, which means which mean I am. And, and I am Jireh, which means provision. I am your provision. When they had a need for victory in their lives, God would come to them and he'd say, I am your victory. Uh, when they had a need for, for peace in their lives, uh, God said, I, I am your peace, Jehovah and Shalom, which means peace in Hebrew. When they just needed to know that, that God was there, God said, I am here. I am there. And, and Moses asked, and, and sometimes we ask, God, who are you? And, and, and his answer to that question is, I'm the one you need me to be. I'm the one who can meet every one of your needs one need at a time. Now, Moses isn't done. He's, he's talked about himself, right? And, and he's talked about God, but he's got somebody else in mind. And so he says, I've got another question, God. What about them, right? What, what about them? What about this group that I'm going to, the, the, the Israelites that you want me to go talk to? What about these people of Israel that I'm going to talk to on your behalf? They, they, might, they might have some questions too. And here's what he says. Moses protested again, saying, look, they won't believe me, talking about the Israelites. They won't do what I tell them. They'll just say, the Lord never appeared to you. I mean, he's almost, he's almost saying, God, I hate to be difficult like, like this, but, but I've got a bad feeling about this. I mean, I'm going to go in there, and I'm going to say, God told me to lead you out of, of, of captivity. That's what God wants to do in your life. He wants to use me to do it. And they're going to say, how do you know God told you that? And, and, and then I'm going to say, well, you know, this burning bush talked to me. And, and God, it's going to go really downhill really, really quickly uh, from there on out. I mean, he had this feeling that, that the people of Israel were going to reject him. And it, and it wasn't completely uh, an, an invalid feeling. Uh, because 40 years before, when he'd, he'd actually talked to some of the Israelites, and he says, I'm going to set you free. And, and they just laughed at him. They rejected him. And so part of the reason that, that he left wasn't just because he was afraid of what he'd done when he murdered that Egyptian, but also he'd already been rejected to some point by the people of, of Israel. And now God is asking him to walk right back in to that, to that fear and that rejection. And I, I think this is huge. I think this is huge for us, uh, this, this thing of, of them, right? And, and, and what are they going to think or what are they going to say? It's a huge thing for us that keeps us from moving forward in what God wants us to do. It's amazing what they keep us from in our lives, right? What will they think? They might reject me. They might ignore me. They might not believe me. Uh, they might not accept me. And sometimes it's even people who are, who are gone 
that we're concerned about, right? Sometimes it's a, it's a friend who moved away a long, long time ago. Sometimes it's, it's the words of an ex-spouse that still echo in our minds. Sometimes it's a, it's, a, it's a disapproving parent who's not even alive anymore. And when you hear somebody say, God, God wants to do something great in and through your life, there's a change that he wants to, to work out in your life. The first voice that you hear sometimes is, is some them voice that, that says, you know, it'll never work. Or you'll never be able to do it. Or you'll never measure up and be able to achieve that. So what do you do when you're, when you're paralyzed by, by a fear of, of what they might think or what they might say or what they might do? How do you break through that? Well, well here's God's answer to Moses. He says, they won't listen to me, Moses said. And then the Lord asks, he says, what do you have in your hand? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. And, and, and God's answer to Moses and God's answer to us is simply, what's, what's in your hand? God's saying, Moses, get your eyes off of them and, and just look at what you have. Look at what's in your hand. Get your, get your eyes off of the unknown and get your eyes on what you do know. Get your eyes off of what might happen or what they might say and look at what you do have and what I can do with what you have. Look at, look at what's in your hand. God's, God's taking something very, very familiar to Moses and, and he's using it to take care of Moses's fears, right? And God's taking care of his fears. But here's the key. Moses had to do something to make this whole thing work. God says, Moses, what's in your hand? I want you to place it in my hand. Look at this. God said, Moses, throw it on the ground. So Moses threw it on the ground and the staff became a snake and Moses was terrified. So he turned and ran away. Let me stop right there and just say, Moses was not a coward. Okay. This is the appropriate response when you look down and there is a snake running around your feet. If you do not run away when you see that, I'm going to question you, okay, and whether everything's okay with you. You should just go ahead and run. It gets better. The Lord told him, take hold of its tail. Moses reaches out and he grabbed it. And by the way, I grew up in the mountains of North Carolina where this is still practiced sometime today. Moses reached out and grabbed it, which, which I just think took a whole lot of faith on his part. And it became a shepherd's staff again. Now, what's going on here in this part of the story? What, what is it that the writer of Exodus wants us to, to know and understand about God in this part of the, of the story? Well, here's what, here's what I think it is. God is saying, Moses, take this familiar thing. I mean, it was the most familiar thing in his life. He was a shepherd. He carried this staff with him everywhere he went. And, and every day of his life. It was not only a tool in his job, but it was a symbol of his status and what he did. And he said, take the most familiar thing in your life, the most ordinary thing in your life, and Moses, you make it available to me. Moses, give it to me and watch what I can do with it. Now, think about that staff. I mean, that, that simple little stick and the rest of Moses' life, if you read the rest of the story of Moses' 40 years of wandering around the desert with the Israelites, if you read the rest of his story, what you'll discover is that, that one day Moses is going to hold this staff over the Red Sea, and it's going to part in half so that the Israelites can escape the Egyptians into safety. Moses, Moses is eventually going to use that staff, and he's going to reach down, and he's going to touch the Nile River. Remember the, the plagues of Egypt? And that Nile River is going to turn to blood. He's going he's to, at one point, the Israelites needed water. They were out of water in the middle of the desert, and Moses takes that staff, and he strikes a rock after God tells him to, and water gushes out of the rock. God, God was saying, this is, this is what I can do if you'll just give it to me. And that staff was ultimately placed in the Ark of the Covenant because the Israelites viewed it as something that was holy. Something amazing happens when you and I look at what's in our hands and we say, God, it's not mine. It's yours. How do you want to use it? Show me how you want to use it. So the question, obviously, is what's in your hand? What's in your hand? And, and I don't know what it is for you, but what is it that you have? that maybe you need to give to God. It, it might be an ability or a talent that you've been kind of holding on to. It might be a relationship. It, it might be a step in faith in your life of some sort. What's in your hand? It, it might, maybe it's a failure. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a, a hurt in your life or a decision that you regret. You know, God can use our failures. He can use our hurts. He can use anything 
when we put it in his hands. Now, you think after this whole snake thing that, that Moses would have, would have been done, but, but he isn't finished. He's got one more question for God. And, and you can almost kind of sense that he's been, he's been saving the best for last, right? The big one for last. And here's his big question. God, how about this? How about this? It's the, it's the big this in his life. It's, it's the thing in his life that he feels like, you know, I cannot serve God because of this. I cannot, I cannot do what you are calling me to do because of, of this thing. Uh, for I'm, I'm disqualified, God, because of this. And, and for Moses, here's what his big thing was. Uh, he says, Lord, I'm just not a good speaker. I mean, I, I've never have been, and I'm not even now... After you've spoken to me, God, after all of this and after you've called me, I still am I'm, I'm not a good speaker. Some historians think that Moses might have had a stutter. We don't really, we don't really know what it was, uh, but whatever it was, Moses felt handicapped by it. And, and there's all kinds of handicaps, aren't there? Uh, some of us feel handicapped by our past. I mean, you're not, but you feel that way. Uh, some of you, you feel handicapped uh, by your education. You're not but you feel that way. You might feel handicapped by your age or your, or your finances or, or, or your emotions or your circumstances. You feel that way. And, and, and here's God's answer. God, God looks at Moses and he says, Moses, who makes mouths? Moses, who, who made your mouth? Who made your ability or inability or whatever it is you think you've got going on with your speech? Who, who made that? Moses, who makes mouth? You, you think I don't understand? You're not the best speaker? Moses, I'm the one who made your mouth. Uh, don't you think I can help you with that? And, and Moses, I'm aware of your struggle, and, but, but I want you to be aware of my ability. And, and God's answer uh, to, to Moses is the same answer to us. He's aware of our inabilities as well. He's aware of that, that thing that we think keeps us from serving and moving forward with God. But he also wants us to be aware of his ability. Now, my big question about Moses is, is how was he able to do this? Uh, I mean, a lot of us have the same questions, and, and we've heard these answers. We, we know that, that God will be with us. We know we shouldn't listen to the thems in our lives. We, we, we know all of these things, but somehow uh, we just can't break through those barriers because we know after reading the rest of the story, Moses did, and Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt. What enabled Moses to get a different perspective on himself to help him begin to live the life that God planned for him to live? Well, the New Testament actually talks about this. It actually addresses this part of Moses' life, this different perspective that Moses had. And, and here's, here's what the writer of Hebrew t says about Moses. It says, he, talking about Moses, he, he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as a, as a greater value than the treasures of Egypt. I mean, Moses had it all. He could have had it all. And why? Because he was looking ahead to his reward. He, he, he's talking about an eternal reward that Moses was, was looking ahead to. He, 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 how could Moses make, uh, you know, get past all of this stuff and, and all of his concerns? Because he wasn't just looking at this earth and the here and the now. He was looking ahead at the eternal reward that God had. He was looking at the big picture of what God wanted to do in the nation of Israel and ultimately what God wanted to do in the world. There's another thing he was looking at, and it's this. It says, he had his eye on the one no eye could see, so he kept right on going. He had his eye on, on God, and by putting his eyes on God, and not on his circumstances, and not on the stuff around him, he was able to have the strength to make the tough decisions and to make the tough choices in life. The truth is, you know, many of us are stuck. And many of us are stuck kind of in our, in our own little worlds that are extremely comfortable, just like Moses was. And, you know, we've got things figured out. We know kind of what's going to happen each day. We maybe even got our future all lined up and all that. And it's pretty routine for most of us. So how do you break out of your own little world? You realize that God is bigger. You, you, you realize that God is doing something bigger in this world. And the better you get to know him, the more he's going to draw you out of that little world and into the big things that he's doing in this world. Here, here's what one theologian said about Moses. I love this. It says, Moses spent the first 40 years 
of his life thinking he was a somebody when he was in Egypt. Then he spent the next 40 years on the backside of the desert realizing he was a nobody. And finally, he spent the last 40 years learning what God can do with a nobody. You know, I don't care whether you feel like a nobody or somebody today. The truth is, God wants to do something great in your life. God wants to do something great through your life. But if that's going to happen for me, if that's going to happen for you, we've got to get our eyes off of, of, of just the here and now and just the circumstances around us and get our eyes on eternity because that's what we're living for. It's gonna, it, if that's going to happen both for you and me, we've got to get our eyes off of ourselves and get our eyes on God who loves us more than we can imagine. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this story. I thank you for Moses, and I thank you just for the, the life that he led, whether it was the good parts or the bad parts, but we have it today as an example to us. And I thank you that ultimately he was able to focus on you, that he was able to get his, his eyes off of himself and his fears and his concerns and the distractions and all of that. And because of that, you did some incredible, incredible things in the lives of the nation of Israel. And ultimately, that led to you doing some incredible things for this world, especially sending your son Jesus here through the nation of Israel. And so, God, I thank you for his life. And over the next few weeks, as we just look at Moses' life and, and the way that you used his life, I, I pray that we would learn some lessons about how you can use us as too. And in the meantime, God, I pray that we would just begin to seek you. We would get our eyes on you and, and that you would begin to pull us out of our own little worlds if we're stuck there and that you would begin to use us in new ways and in mighty ways. In Christ's name I pray, amen.